Hello friends and welcome to Online Church here with Center Congregational Church in Meriden, Connecticut. My name is Pastor Connor and on behalf of our entire congregation, I'd like to extend our open and affirming welcome to you, which means that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome to be a part of our faith community. And we are an open and affirming church in the United Church of Christ, which really means that no matter who you are, or how you identify, you are welcome to bring your full and authentic self into our community and feel our love that we have to give to you. Uh, before I want begin, I want to lift up a few reminders for us, for our community. We have a check-in form that you likely scrolled past on the way to this video. If you could hop out and fill that out when you get the chance, we'd love to know who is worshiping with us on a week-to-week -week basis. That's kind of been the way we've been keeping track during COVID-19. We also have a prayer request form that you likely also scrolled past on the way to this video. Uh, if you could fill that out, if you have any prayer requests uh, that you'd either like lifted up in worship or if you would like them lifted up in private, that's a great way to do that. You can also call or email prayer requests to me as well. You can find my contact information on the website, centerchurchmeriden.org. Uh, and finally, uh, we have announcements on our weekly e-news page. Uh, if you go to centerchurchmeriden.org backslash e-news, that's the place to find them. If you're on the website already, you can find them at the What's New at CCC tab on the website. So. Feel free to check those things out and see what is going on with our faith community these days. Friends, if you join me now in a state of prayer as we begin with our call to worship. The good news of the gospel brings power to the people. Among the ordinary and mundane, divine possibilities await. Even when we believe it is not so, we have so much to offer. God calls us healers and prophets, teachers and companions. God enables miracles among us. In the hearts of the willing, divinity dwells. We gather and remember the power of God. Hello friends, how are you? I hope that you have been getting out in the sun and enjoying some warmth this week like I have. It isn't it so nice to see the sun? Really missed it when it was so gloomy. But I also have to tell you, I'm really happy that there's still snow on the ground. We actually have a real snowy winter, which is in my mind, wonderful. So the message that I want to share with you this week was inspired a bit by an article that I read by Charles Pope, and it really got me thinking. 
See, the Bible passage that Pastor Connor is going to share is from the book of Romans. And Romans is uh, letters that Paul wrote to the people of Rome. And in the passage for this week, Paul talks about a very faithful man named Abraham. And we owe a lot to Abraham. In fact, you could even say that uh, we belong to Abraham or the family of Abraham. Well, not in the traditional sense, like sharing DNA with him and being tracing it back to him. But we can say in some ways that our faith is traced back to Abraham. See, Abraham's faith was one that was incredible. He believed God when God told him that at a very old age that he would become a father. In fact, the Bible tells us that Abraham became a father at a hundred. It's also a faith that was the root of three great religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam can all be traced back to Abraham. So, you might remember Abraham from some of the songs that we've sung in, sung in Sunday school, uh, like um, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had Father Abraham, I am one of them, and so are you. So let's all praise the Lord. Do you remember that one? <laughs> but probably my favorite song about Abraham that we've sung in Sunday school is kind of a simple lyric song. It's called Rock of My Soul. It's very fitting to talk about Rock of My Soul this month because it was a song that enslaved Black people sang as a spiritual. And it's given comfort and moved people for over 150 years. So this one is goes something like this. Rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, rock of my soul in the bosom of Abraham, oh, rock of my soul. Do you remember that one? So I can remember singing that to my children when they were young. Do you remember having maybe a grandma or a grandpa or a parent singing Rock of My Soul to you? Maybe even when they were going back and forth and rocking in a rocking chair to the beat of the song. <laughs> so I can, when I think about singing that to my children, I can still feel as if I was there. I recall feeling so connected to them, you know, providing them with warmth and shelter and comfort in my arms. I think Rock of My Soul is a song we could really use today. You know, a song of comfort and care, a song that reminds us that we're always in the loving arms of God. We can be like a child running to a parent with a cut knee or after a, a bad dream, going and seeking that peaceful rest and refuge that only the arms of a loving parent can provide. And God is there, always with arms outstretched. My prayer is that we can all be able to feel that love, to feel that refuge, to feel that warmth and security and peace in God's arms. Oh, rock of my soul. Amen. Our first scripture lesson today comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am El Shaddai. Walk with me and be trustworthy. I will make a covenant between us and I will give you many, many descendants. Abram fell on his face and God said to him, But me, my covenant is with you. You will be the ancestor of many nations. And because I have made you the ancestor of many nations, your name will no longer be Abram, but Abraham. 
I will make you very fertile. I will produce nations from you, and kings will come from you. I will set up my covenant with you and your descendants after you in every generation as an enduring covenant. I will be your God and your descendants God after you. I will give you and your descendants the land in which you are immigrants, the whole land of Canaan, as an enduring possession, and I will be their God. God continued, saying to Abraham, As for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants, in every generation. This is my covenant that you and your descendants must keep. Circumcise every male. You must circumcise the flesh of your foreskins, and it will be a symbol of the covenant between us. On the eighth day after birth, every male in every generation must be circumcised, including those who are not your own children, those born in your household and those purchased with silver from their foreigners. Be sure you circumcise those born in your household and those purchased with your silver. Your flesh will embody my covenant as an enduring covenant. Any uncircumcised male whose flesh of his foreskin remains uncircumcised will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. God said to Abraham, As for your wife Sarai, you will no longer call her Sarai. Her name will now be Sarah. I will bless her and even give you a son from her. I will bless her so that she becomes she will become nations and kings of people will come from her. Our second scripture lesson today comes from Romans chapter 4, verses 13 through 25. The promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. If they inherit because of the law, then faith has no effect, and the promise has been canceled. The law brings about wrath, but when there isn't any law, there isn't any violation of the law. That's why the inheritance comes through faith, so that it will be on the basis of God's grace. In that way, the promise is secure for all of Abraham's descendants, not just those who are related by law, through circumcision, but also for those who are related by the faith of Abraham, who is the father of all of us. As it is written, I have appointed you to be the father of many nations. So Abraham is our father in the eyes of God, in whom he had faith, the God who gives life to the dead and calls things that don't exist into existence. When it was beyond hope, he had faith in the hope that he would become the father of many nations in keeping with the promise God spoke to him. That's how many descendants you will have. Without losing faith, Abraham, who was nearly 100 years old, took into account his own body, which was as good as dead, and Sarah's womb, which was certainly dead. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. But the scripture that says it was credited to him wasn't written only for Abraham's sake. It was written also for our sake, because it is going to be credited to us too. It will be credited to those of us who have faith in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over because of our mistakes and he was raised to meet the requirements of righteous, righteousness for us. This past week in our sermon reflection group, we reflected on the topic of grace. Grace was a present theme in our previous week's sermon, 
where I talked about King David and the grace that he receives from God. The group discussion was deep this week and really fantastic. We got onto the subject of how unfair it can be for people like David to receive grace and how difficult it can be to watch people receive what we think they just don't deserve. We also talked about the beauty of the fact that even though others are offered grace, we too are offered the same equitable and abundant, loving grace of God. This week, our scripture lessons continue the focus on that promise of grace, but shift the attention toward ordinary people rather than kings. This week's lectionary texts place their emphasis on the righteousness of everyday people like you and me, and not just those who are alive right now or those who have come before us, but those yet to live as well. In our text from Genesis today, we find the origin story of the people of Israel, the story that begins with Abram and Sarai. God comes to Abram, who is 99 years old, and he and his wife Sarai have lived a long life, but one without children of their own. By this point in the story, Sarai has instructed Abram to go and have a child with her slave Hagar. Now, there are a lot of threads that can be followed when we think about it in that light Uh, and following the events of Genesis 16 threads like what uh, what can we learn about how they treated Hagar as a human and what we can learn about how they treated her dignity uh, what we can learn about consent and what we can learn about slavery in the Bible but these stories are laying the groundwork for the events of our reading today God appears to Abram and begins to explain to him a whole host of things that Abram initially reacts to as purely nonsense. God speaks of a covenant that Abram will enter into, one that will result in generation after generation of descendants, who we as readers know to be the Israelite people. God tells him that if he commits to this covenant, Abram will be the ancestor of many different nations, many different nations of people, and that his descendants will include kings. Those descendants will be gifted the land of Canaan, the promised land. Now, all of it is a little hard to believe for Abram at first, but he comes around. Uh, Abram's side of the deal is pretty difficult, too and is described by God in pretty graphic detail in verses 9 through 14, where God explains how Abram must embody his part in this covenant. And that is the nature of covenant. It's a relationship where, one or more, where two or more sides pledge to actively and constructively participate in community together. For Abram, this involves some transformation, both in body and identity, as he and Sarai both receive their new names from God, the names that we know them popularly by, Abraham and Sarah. As a result, that embodied transformation of both the body, identity, and spirit, God blesses Abraham and Sarah with something they never thought they could have, a child. But The blessing is not one that Abraham and Sarah get to fully experience. They're blessed with their own child, Isaac, but all the rest of that promise that God explains is something that will last way beyond their own lives and will affect people that Abraham and Sarah will never live long enough to know or to meet. And that nuanced part of God's promise to Abraham, the covenant between the two, is that the covenant does not solely just affect the two parties involved. Abraham's responsibility is not just to God, but to those descendants that God promises him. If he does not hold up his end of the deal, his commitment to righteous covenant, generations will suffer. And if they don't hold up that covenant, 
generations after them will as well. The transformation that Abraham undertakes is one that God hopes, though, will set up blessings for generations to come. Abraham and Sarah's story highlights the essence of being in righteous relationship with God. When we are active in engaging God's promise, it transforms us in amazing ways. We take on newness of identity and embody that loving promise in righteous ways. And in our faithful, active pursuit and embodiment of that righteousness, our spiritual cups are filled in return. And not only are they filled, but they're filled to the point of overflowing so that we might pour out that love onto others as we continue to pursue that active embodiment of God's love. The beauty of God's promise to each of us is that it affects more than just us. It causes a ripple effect. And when we shift toward the righteous way of God, it shows. Like I've said, like I've said in the past, the gospel has evidence. The good news leaves behind marks. God's promise is not limited to individual relationships, but is one large communal covenant. And Abraham's descendants are expected to live into their part, just as Abraham did. Paul says in our text from Romans, it was written also for our sake because it is going to be credited to us too. It will be credited to those of us who have faith in the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was handed over because of our mistakes and he was raised to meet the requirements of righteousness for us. In saying this, Paul reiterates the generational inheritance of this promise that was discussed in the book of Genesis. Paul is speaking to the house of Israel in this moment, those who claim and understand themselves to be the descendants of Abraham, as well as to the non-Hebrew Gentiles that have joined the small Jewish, Jewish sect of Christ followers in that day. During this time in Christian history, there is widespread debate over circumcision and whether or not non-Jewish followers should be permitted to join the faith movement without following through on that practice as Abraham did. Now, the Jewish community who have traditionally practiced this as a mark of receiving God's promise contend that Gentiles should mark themselves in this way too. Paul provides a counter-argument, though, in his letter to the faith community in Rome. Paul suggests that Abraham's promise is not solely inherited through that practice, which he refers to as the law. Paul, in asserting that his, this practice is not the only way to receive the promise of Abraham, is advocating for a radical inclusivity in this moment. Many would read this passage and believe that Paul is rejecting the law and rejecting the Torah itself and all the things that they say. But Paul absolutely believes that those things are important influences and guides for the faith journey, but says that our salvation is founded upon faith. Paul opens the doors for Gentile, Christian Gentile Christ followers to receive the same generational blessings of Abraham as those who believe themselves to be directly descended from Abraham through the unifying faith in Christ. What Paul is trying to teach in this moment is that ritual practices like circumcision, while important and really identify how we practice our faith, are not the foundations of our faith, are not the foundations of our relationship with God. Instead, that covenanted relationship, like Abraham's, is founded on trust, founded on faith. Paul describes Abraham's faith-based righteousness, saying, the promise to Abraham and to his descendants that he would inherit the world didn't come through the law, but through the righteousness that comes from faith. He didn't hesitate with a lack of faith in God's promise, but he grew strong in faith and gave glory to God. 
He was fully convinced that God was able to do what he promised. Therefore, it was credited to him as righteousness. In his faith, Abraham found the conviction to transform and be transformed. God entered into that relationship with Abraham because Abraham trusted God to set him on that right path. The promise was not given solely because of what Abraham did, but rather the faith in which he responded to God's call. In naming this, Paul identifies what all Christ followers can find unity in, their faith. The beauty of being a follower of Christ is that Christ-like values embodied in Jesus transcend religious practice. Jews and Gentiles alike, the people of many nations whom Abraham is their, the faith father of, can embody the righteous values of Christ. Paul and Jesus' other disciples begin realizing this mission of making disciples of many nations through this idea that it is faith in a God of love, peace, and equity that defines their discipleship. Though the nations differ in culture, practice, and history, they can be united in the faith of Christ that seeks to bring God's righteous, loving justice into the world. Those of us Christians who are listening to this sermon represent one of those many nations to which God refers to in Genesis and that Paul repeats again in Romans. We sit here thousands of years removed from Paul, yet with the same promise laid at our feet. If we have faith that walking with God will lead to a righteous end through whatever that path may bring, we become heirs of the promise of Abraham and set future generations up to know that same love and peace that we know when we come to trust God faithfully. Amen. This week in our prayers, Barbara Langner and Liza Warenda are lifting up thoughts and prayers for the family of their friend and colleague, Evelyn Beebe, who passed away recently. They are also lifting up prayers of healing for their friend, Donna Muley, as she recovers from surgery. This week, Betty Lighty is lifting up prayers for Linda Hetrick, who is recovering from COVID-19. Maureen Hamilton is lifting up prayers for little Liam and his family after Liam took a bad fall and is recovering from a severe concussion. We're also lifting up prayers for Lorraine and Ken's son, Scott, who is recovering from COVID-19 and who thankfully has mild symptoms. We're also keeping in our prayers Jacqueline Jeffers, who is recovering from a wrist injury after a recent fall. I would also like to lift up prayers for a friend named Alex Garcia, who I met serving a previous church and his family as they are celebrating their reunification as Alex has no longer, has been deemed no longer a priority for deportation and has been given protective status. So he now gets to reunify with his family after being in sanctuary at Christ Church in Missouri for 1,252 days. So we are celebrating Alex's reunification with his family. If you would join me now in a moment of prayer. Incarnate One, in so many ways we have learned to minimize our own potential. As individuals, a community, as people of faith, Letting others define our worth and capabilities denies us our own ability and power. 
May your presence among us awaken and enliven all that you envision for us, that we may be faithful to you and the generations to come. Let us remember the witness, the faith, the righteousness of those who have come before us, if not for the ones who dreamed of justice, practiced courage, and nurtured love, what hope would we ourselves have? Liberating one, we hope to rise to the calling of this era. There is trouble, there is suffering, but there is potential for love and hope and peace. Keep us attuned to what you ask of us in these days and encourage us in our faith that we may believe we have what we need to live it out together. We pray all this in the name of the one who came as a symbol of your loving promise, Christ Jesus, who taught us to pray this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive those who owe us debts. Lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. With faith, remember the good news. The Spirit of Christ accompanies us. This is not an abstract claim. This is a promise that God still takes on flesh. When we act out of our sacred potential, Christ is alive in the very depths of who we are, in our flesh, in our communities. Turning away from 
evil's hopes for our complicity and complacency, let us go now, friends, emboldened, encouraged, and assured. The power and promise of God lives in us. May it be so. Amen. Thank you.